Hello, everybody. This is Brandon again. We are picking up our study once more. We're going to be going over the next chapter, which will be chapter five of Tertullian's Against Praxis. This will be uh, centered around the evolution of the Son or the Word of God from the Father by divine procession. Let me expand that. Illustrated by the operation of the human thought and consciousness. So, Tertullian is going to give us. A, an example of what he understands divine procession to be and why it is itself different uh, from some of the, how can you say, attempts to explain the divine uh, procession. But what we're going to play, pay a special attention to as apostolic Pentecostals, we are going to notice without hesitation that the way in which he articulates divine procession is nowhere near the same way that our Trinitarian uh, contemporaries today would describe it. And so the first paragraph, but since they will have the two to be but one, so that the Father shall be deemed to be the same as the Son, it is only right that the whole question respecting the Son should be examined as to whether he exists and who is he and the mode of his existence. Thus shall the truth itself be uh, uh, secure its own sanction from the scriptures and the interpretations which guard them. There are some alleged that uh, even Genesis opens thus in Hebrew, in the beginning God made for himself a son. Now this is probably the thought of maybe someone, uh, maybe a, a Arians or someone who maybe agree with his thought process, but even he recognizes that's nonsense. And there is no ground for this. I am led to other arguments derived from God's own dispensation in which he existed before the creation of the world up to the generation of the Son. For before all things, God was alone. Now notice in this context, God is alone being the Father, being in himself and for himself, universe and space and all things. Moreover, he was alone because there was nothing external to him but himself. Yet even not then was he alone. Uh, and, and this is the part where it's about to get good this line for he had uh, for he had within him uh, that which he possessed uh, in himself that is to say his own reason for God is rational reason was first in him and so all things were from himself this reason is his own thought or consciousness now what gets me is that when as one as Pentecostals when we use this approach to explaining the nature of God we are readily accused of heresy by stating logos uh, and interpreting it in the native understanding of its its usage, which means to be the thought or action or plan. And Tertullian, even though he is not a modalist or he is not oneness in his worldview, he is emphatically making it clear that the pre-existence of the word or the logos uh, was that which existed previously as the thought or the plan of God. Now, this is uh, part and parcel to how most of us see it today. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit further. By which term we also designate word of discourse. And therefore, it is now unusual with our people owing to the mere simple interpretation of the term to say that the word was in the beginning with God, although it would be more suitable to regard reason as the more ancient, because God had not word from the beginning, but he had reason even before the beginning because also word itself consists of reason, which it thus proves to have been the prior existence as being its own substance. Not that this distribution is of any practical moment, for although God had not yet sent out his word, he still had within himself, both in company and with included within his very reason, as he silently planned and arranged within himself everything which he was afterwards about to utter through his word. Now, whilst he was planning and arranging with his own reason, he was actually causing that to become word, which he was dealing with in the way of word or discourse. And that you may the more readily understand this. Now, this is when he's about to give the, the, the example, in my opinion, which is really going to just take it home for anybody who has any doubts. And that you may more readily understand this. Consider, first of all, from that your own self who are made in the image and likeness of God, for what purpose it is that you also possess reason in yourself who are a rational creature as being not only made by a rational artificer, but actually animated out of his substance. Observe then that when you are silently conversing with yourself, 
this very process is carried on with you by your reason, which meets you with a word. This line, every moment of your thought at every impulse of your conception, whatever you think, there is a word, whatever you conceive, there is reason. You must need speak it uh, in your mind. And while you're speaking, you admit speech as an interlocutor with you involved in which there is this reason whereby while in thought you're holding converse with your words, you are by reciprocal action producing thought by means of that converse with your word. Thus, in a certain sense, the word is a second person within you. Now, notice within a certain sense, not a literal sense, in a certain sense. <laughs> and he's already explained to us what that is. Through which in thinking you utter speech and through which also by recip uh, reciprocity of process in uttering speech, you generate thought. The word is itself a different thing from yourself. Now, how much more fully is all this transacted in God whose image and likeness even you are regarded as being inasmuch as he has reason within himself? Uh, even while he is silent and involved in that reason, his word I may therefore without rashness first lay this down as a fixed principle that even then before the creation of the universe, God was not alone. How was God not alone? This is where Tertullian is going to bring it home and we're coming to a close. Since he had within himself both reason and inherent reason, his word, which he made second to himself by agitating it with himself. So for all of those who really like to work at it and try to build this revisionist Trinitarian history, uh, uh, there's always been this accession of, uh, uh, of Trinitarian dogma. You have the first person who, uh, and of course there was, I forgot the gentleman's name uh, around uh, the second century, but who used the phrase uh, Trinitus, which would be Tertullian. It is apparent that Tertullian did not even believe in the eternal son. His model of uh, Trinitarianism is success of Trinitarianism, which is not an eternal model. So this is going to be interesting to see more of his argumentation because in his attempt to argue with praxis, he is actually exposing the fact that he himself is not orthodox. Hey, remember to share, rate, and subscribe. Let somebody know that we have a holiness Pentecostal uh, uh, podcast, commentary, all of the above going on. And hey, I look forward to see you in the next chapter.